Hello, in this episode of Exploring Rust, I'm going to take a look at Rust functions. Rust functions are very straightforward until they aren't. So let's try to define a function here and see how that goes. And apparently we can put them anywhere, so I don't have to put this above the main function. I'll create a function just called run since I don't really know what it should do. And of course we can just call this from main. So let's write run right here. And that works like you'd expect. If I want run to take some parameters, I just list them here. Again, like you'd expect. So let's say we want this to accept x of type i32 and y of type f64. Maybe it could print these out. So let's try print ln exclamation mark and uh, string in there. Let's have some of these. Can I actually put x and y in there? Let's try this. I'm still not clear about this. I'd like to <laughs> look up this macro stuff later on, but I think my Rust isn't perhaps quite advanced enough to do that yet. So let's try cargo run anyway. Yeah, I've got to actually supply some arguments though. So 5.2, let's try that. Okay, so that actually works, that's fine. And the default return type of a function is something called unit. We specify the return type with an arrow and unit is these open and close round brackets. So that's basically unchanged, I think. Yeah, it works. So notice I haven't put a semicolon here, but I can do, I think, because it's not returning anything. Return values are going to require a little bit of explanation. So in Rust, Rust is apparently an expression oriented, I think, is the expression a Rust bot uses, an expression oriented language. And an expression, of course, is something that evaluates to a single value. So in Rust, I can do something like this. Let's say let x equal, and we'll have curly brackets. And in here, let's have a y maybe set that equal to something. I'll increment y, so I'm going to have to make this mutable. Let's add 5 to it, and let's change it to mute. Now, this whole thing can boil down to a single value, and the value that it's going to boil down to is going to be whatever's last before this closing brace. So I could just, for example, put y there, and then this will evaluate to 10, because the value of y is 10 at this point. And I'm not going to put a semicolon there, so we don't want a semicolon. The expression that's on the last line of some block like this is what the block will evaluate to. So this isn't a statement, it's just a little expression. Then let's try doing print ln exclamation mark curly brackets and I'll put x in there. Let's see if I've got this right. Yeah, it doesn't like that, but I've just got to add a semicolon right there. Okay, so now we've got 10 coming out down here. So this is a little unusual and the bottom line is that whatever's last between curly brackets is what the curly brackets actually evaluate to as an expression. And this also applies to functions. So with functions, we can use the return keyword, but apparently we don't have to and it's usual that you don't. Let's create another function here. So I'll create a function, let's call it add five. And following the Rust style guide, I'll use an underscore there. Is this called snake case, I think? So round brackets, curly brackets, and we'll make that accept an integer. So let's maybe just call it i, and we'll say it's a type i32. And now I want this to return this value plus five. So I just put i plus five here, no semicolon, and that becomes the return value of the function. Let's try it. So here I'll try saying let value equal 10, semicolon there, and then let result equal add five passing value. I could have just passed in the 10 directly, actually. Actually, let's do that. It's more sense. Actually, no, it doesn't because I've got something to um, demonstrate, which is why, I, I'm, why I'm doing it like this and storing this in a value. And then we'll do print ln and let's print here. Let's print value and also result. Does this work? Let's see. Oh yeah, I've got to specify the return type. That would help. So that's going to be i32. Okay, we try again. Got to have a semicolon here. It's really hard to remember exactly where there should be semicolons and where there shouldn't. Okay, now it works, 1015. Now I think this is all pretty straightforward. So defining a function, that's really easy. The only slightly strange thing about it is that we don't usually use the return keyword. We usually just 
use an expression on the last line of the function, which isn't followed by a semicolon. And by the way, something that I didn't fully appreciate when I did the last video was that that means we can write stuff like the following. I could make this a if. So I could say here, if uh, let's maybe say i is less than zero, then in that case, I'm just going to return zero. Otherwise, let's say, let's have an else. And in this case, I'm going to return i plus five. Now that should work because this is an expression which evaluates to whatever's on the last line. No semicolons there. And this whole thing is on the last line of this block here. So that should be the return value of the function. So it's going to be either this or this. So what I was thinking in the last video is that we have really two kinds of if in Rust. We have if statements and if expressions. And that will be true in some languages like Python or Kotlin, I think. But in Rust, they're really the same syntactical construct as far as I could see. There's just one kind of if here. Let's now try this and you can see that it actually does work. So I suppose this is kind of giving us a bit of a preview of what the documentation means by Rust being an expression oriented language. In other languages, you'd need to be collecting these results in a variable or at least have a return keyword in there. But apart from that, this is all pretty straightforward. Now here's where it's not straightforward and it's the same place that it's not straightforward in a lot of languages. We've seen that you can create a string in Rust by doing something like let s equal and just set it to some text. And that's a valid string which we can print. So we'll do print line exclamation mark. I'm still confused about when I can actually use this kind of style of printing a variable and when I can't. I think that will work. Let's try. Yeah, that works fine. Prints hello. But there's another kind of string in Rust because this is actually an immutable string. This text is just hard coded into the executable. But there are also mutable strings in Rust so that the value of the string can be determined at runtime. And of course, in that case, that involves Rust allocating memory on the heap. So it needs to grab some memory from the heap and then that can be flexibly sized. So to create those kinds of strings, that looks like this. We write string colon colon from and we can supply some text here, like for example, hello. Not sure if that will actually compile. Let's try it, see if I can actually print this out. Yeah, that says hello as well. So this is just another type of string, but it's a mutable string. And here's where it starts to get a little bit weird. So let's create a function called greet maybe. And I'm going to say that this can be passed a string. So let's have a S. I wouldn't usually use variable names that are this short, but S of type string. And actually, I think that will do for my purposes just at the moment. What I want to do is call that function and pass S to it. So let's say greet S. And I will try to compile that. So when I try to compile it, we get uh, an error. And if I take a look, it's talking about how I should consider cloning the value. And further up, it says the value is borrowed here. And this parameter takes ownership of the value. So this has to do with Rust's ownership concept. If you know C++, it's a bit like we've moved this string to this parameter rather than copying it or something. The string is no longer valid after it's been passed to the function. And we'll get into looking at that in the next video, I think. But meanwhile, let's just do something with this string to make this compile at least. One thing I could do here, since it is a mutable string, is do s dot, I think it was push str. I might have to check this. Let's try this and see if I can add something onto that string. And let's return s at the end here. So actually, I don't want return. Normally, I would type return s semicolon. And I think that will work actually. So let's actually let's actually just try that. But what that would let me do would be I could say here, let s equal. So this is a new variable shadowing this variable. But I think that should enable this code to work. And it should print hello there. I'm just not sure if I've got that right. Let's try it. Yeah, one thing is, again, I've got to specify the return type which is going to be string. Try again. Now it says I can't modify the string because it's not mutable. So let's put mute in here. Look how good the error messages are with the compiler here. And now it actually works. 
I'm a little bit surprised. I wasn't sure if I'd remembered that correctly. So what's going on here? Well, I'm just returning it from the function. I'm returning it. I'm returning a string somehow from this function, setting a completely new variable, also called s, equal to the return value, and then I can print it and it's fine. But of course, the more typical Rust way to return this string would be to just do it like that. In fact, I wonder if Pustra returns a string. Anyway, let's try that. You can see that works. What about if I get rid of it altogether? No, that doesn't work. Okay, so let's just put this back. I figured if Pustra returns the string, maybe I could just do this and that's all I need. Hang on a minute. Is it just that semicolon that's bothering it? Let's try. No, for whatever reason, it doesn't like that. I don't know why. I guess it doesn't return a string then, but this works just fine. So yeah, this has to do with ownership. There's an idea in Rust that every variable has an owner. It can only have one owner. And when the owner goes out of scope, then a drop function is called and memory is cleaned up. But we'll dig into that in the next video. One thing I wanted to mention briefly, I'm not sure if I should mention this or not, quite honestly. I hate controversy, but I've been watching some videos about Rust and I'm gaining the impression that some of the people, some of the people involved with Rust might be absolutely unhinged and a bit aggressive. They don't like any criticism of Rust. They want Rust to be used absolutely everywhere. And temperamentally, these seem to be really strange people very easily offended. So there's there's a terrible lot of politics apparently surrounding Rust and also the Rust Foundation. In my view, the amount of politics that ought to be in programming is zero, but it seems the Rust Foundation has tried to create an inclusive organization. And of course, when you hear that word inclusive, often it means the exact opposite. In the past and still to an extent today, we had this idea of professionalism, where if you go and do a job, you don't bring your whole self to work or anything like that. You just go and do the job. You're careful about what you reveal about yourself to everyone, bearing in mind that different people have different opinions, different views on things. So you have kind of an interface at work that you present to people. And then we didn't have to worry about what anyone's politics was or what they do in their spare time or whatever. But now we've got this idea that you bring your whole self to work and then you've got to have all kinds of authoritarian rules to prevent people from fighting with each other. And it seems like a bit of that has gone down with the Rust Foundation. But these are just impressions that I'm getting from watching a few videos here and there. Maybe I'm completely wrong. As regards Rust being perhaps hyped excessively with people somewhat aggressively trying to push other people to use Rust when perhaps Rust isn't really completely ready for the things that they want it to do. Well, I think we've seen this before, probably many times before. In fact, I remember, for example, when Ruby came out, some of those people seemed obsessive. They seemed like they wanted all code everywhere as much as possible to be written in Ruby. And, you know, let's face it, I'm sure Ruby is a really nice language, but it's just another computer programming language. And it was never going to be one of the really big ones like Java or C++. So if you've been programming a while, you've seen these languages come and go. You've seen that they sometimes attract excessively ardent fan bases. And then after a while, that language often fades into obscurity. With Rust, I do think it has the potential to become a language as big as Java or C or C++. I think it's possible that could happen, but it's by no means guaranteed. And if there's a load of political stuff going down, and it's all turning into a political battle, obviously that's going to be a negative factor that counts against Rust. Anyway, that's it for this video. Next time we'll get on to looking at ownership.